sandwiches, ice cream, coffee and snacks, and many other pleasing treats. Our foods are fresh and tasty, our drinks satisfying and refreshing. They're so good. Welcome to Average Joe's Drive-In. And now, on with the show. Everybody, welcome to episode number 92 of Average Joe's Drive In. This is the last episode of Horathon 2018. And uh, this one has been a lot of fun. I have got to watch a whole bunch of films that I have never seen before or hadn't seen in a really long time. So it was very uh, interesting this year to just not watch a bunch of old favorite stuff, you know, that I love. Um, I did watch a few of those too, but nothing, you know, nothing like it past years. This, this was a lot of fun. Um, I got to a lot of movies and we have a pile of stuff to talk about. Um, so sorry if my voice is a little off today, I'm just kind of, uh, not feeling too good. So my, uh, little, little stuffed up it happens at that time of year. And, um, uh, so apologies in advance for that. So let's get it kicked off and get into this because I think I've got close to 20 reviews today. This is going to be a long episode. So bear with me, have fun, and I hope you guys enjoy it. And let's kick it off with 2006's Altered. Stand out here in the open. Get back in the van. Well, the thing's in the van. What? Wyatt, I know you're in there, Wyatt. Look. I know you don't want to see us. I understand, but me and the boys, we got no choice. 
We've been out to Nixon's farm, Wyatt. They're after us. This is a horror sci-fi thriller directed by Eduardo Sanchez. Has an 88-minute runtime. Rated R. Stars Adam Kaufman, Catherine Manigan, and Brad William Henke. I watched this one on DVD. 15 years ago, a group of men's lives were forever changed by a strange occurrence. Now the same group of men will spend a night together in terror. This is one I haven't watched in a while and have been looking forward to revisiting. While it wasn't on my original list for October, I decided to throw it on. It just seemed like the right way to end the night. This is one of those films that I think largely slipped under the radar. It was even a bit panned at the time it came out. While it's far from being perfect, it's very en- it's a very enjoyable film. I prefer films like Fire in the Sky and The Fourth Kind and even Signs over this, but it isn't too far behind those. In a lot of ways, those four lumped together would make for one hell of a mini marathon session, which is something I may have to do in the very near future. The technical aspects are all very solid. The cinematography, score, and acting all work very well. There are several shots in the movie that are breathtaking with the way they are lit and the atmosphere they throw off. The effects in this are pretty damn awesome. If you're a fan of practical effects work, you will definitely appreciate it. The one area where this one loses some points with me is the story itself. While I like the story, I felt like they missed a bit of a chance to delve deeper into each character's background. We get hints, but it never really feels like it's flushed out to full potential. It also feels like it just ends rather abruptly. While it's not a horrible ending, it could have been so much more. I wanted to see something more intense. Overall, this is one I continue to enjoy and throw on every handful of years. If you've never seen this one in like alien abduction type flicks, you should track it down and give it a watch. My rating is a 5.5 out of 10. The average IMDB rating is a 5.7 out of 10. Up next, 2014's Cooties. Sorry, didn't see that. Well, maybe you should take in your surroundings more. Yeah. You are so ugly. You look like you got chicken pox. Your chicken pox is made out of hemorrhoids. You yeah. listening to me? What, are you sick or something? Oh, look! Carnage! You can't eat the teachers, man! Go Shelly has cooties. He's right. This is a foodborne virus. The chicken nuggets. The virus is only dangerous if you haven't gone through puberty. Are you kidding me? At three o'clock, the parents will come to pick up their kids. We can signal them for help. Hey! 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 You're gonna kill them! Hey! That's Indiana. That's Ohio. It's an epidemic. Let's roll! Remember that suiting up montage in every action film? This is that scene. Are we ready? Ready. 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 I'm gay. Oh, I knew it. This is an action comedy horror directed by Jonathan Millot and Carrie Murnan. Has an 88 minute runtime, rated R, stars Elijah Wood, Rain Wilson, and Allison Pill. I watched this one on Blu ray. A mysterious virus hits an isolated elementary school. 
transforming the kids into feral swarm of mass savages. An unlikely hero must lead a motley band of teachers in the fight of their lives. I watched this one a while back and really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good, self-aware horror comedy. I'm always up for those when they're done right. I recently picked it up on Blu-ray and have been anxiously waiting to view it. This one is still a hell of a lot of fun. I'm not 100% sure I enjoyed it as much this time around as I did on my first viewing, but it's still damn good. This one, I think, falls way more on the comedy side of things than the horror side, but it has some fun moments. The characters are overdone portrayals of people we all know. That's part of what makes it fun. The stereotypes are played to full effect in an unabashed way. That, mixed with some overzealous tropes, make this a very easy-to-digest fun ride. The technical aspects of the film are well done, and the acting is very good. If you like gore, there are actually some decent moments. While not too scary, it's solid in that department. While the aforementioned overdone character portrayal is great in what makes the film work, it's also part of some of the more meh moments of the film. Some of it gets played out quick and becomes almost annoying. It far from ruins the film or anything, but I wish they would have reined it in some uh, just a little bit. If you like good horror comedy, this is one to check out. This is a type of film you can appreciate as a horror lover, but I think non-horror lovers would appreciate it as well. My rating is a 6.5 out of 10. The average IMDB rating is a 5.7 out of 10. Up next, 2015's Digging Up the Marrow. In every society, there are the deviants, the ones who are pure evil. He's been shooting this documentary. Love to roll. Take one. 100 yards beneath the surface of the earth exists a metropolis that mirrors ours in very many respects. I call it the Marrow. William Decker claims that he's found monsters. I see their shapes moving through the woods. Is he crazy? Um, is he is he mentally ill? Is it all a hoax? You believe this? You're a believer. What if this guy's conspiracy theories are all true? Please don't get hurt. It's right up there, the address to the marrow. Okay, do you, do you see anything? Oh God, he's right here in front of us now. I, I, I don't see it. Turn, turn it on. Turn on the light. No, 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 no. no. Turn on the light. If it's here, I want to no, see it. Turn off that light. Turn no. on the light. You're too blind to see what's going on around you. Well, you're gonna see. You're gonna see. Are you kidding me? You should just go. I warned you. I warned you. Some of them were dangerous. Mr. Decker, just tell me the truth about one single thing. They know we found them. Stay away. This is a biography, drama, fantasy, horror, directed by Adam Green, has an 88-minute runtime, not rated, stars Ray Wise, Adam Green, and Will Barrett. I watched this one on Shudder. A documentary exploring general base monster art takes an odd turn when the filmmakers are contacted excuse me, by a man who claims he can prove that monsters are indeed real. I didn't know a whole lot about this other than it was an Adam Green film and it was done documentary style. It hasn't honestly been high on my radar for films to watch, but one I wanted to get around to eventually as I, you know, usually enjoy Adam Green's work. It fell into that category of films I haven't seen yet, so I decided to give it a shot for my 2018 horathon. While I didn't love this one, I did find it enjoyable for the most part. It's a pretty easy watch. I like the story uh, and the fact that they are trying to chase down real monsters. It's kind of like a reality TV show that you get sucked into watching because what if? The film is pretty straight ahead. While it doesn't break any new ground, it does work in what it's trying to achieve. I like that fact. They use almost all members of their production team in the film instead of just a bunch of random people. It does feel more legit because of it. 
I will say that Ray Wise is awesome in this. His performance alone makes the film worth a watch. It's worth a watch for horror fans. I'm glad I watched it, but it's not one I will probably go back to anytime soon. If you're a fan of Green's work, you'll appreciate it. My rating is a 5.5 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 5.8 out of 10. Up next, the film that I actually ended my 2018 horrorthon with, and that is 2002's Dog Soldiers. One of the most explosive, brutal, and purely enjoyable horror debuts since The Evil Dead. Genuinely frightening. Jaws, Aliens, and Predator with a werewolf twist. Absolutely brilliant, ah! thrilling, Mind your tongue. exciting, ah! scary. I don't scare that easy. And funny. I'm sold. A horror film with bite. You are. Sold! I'm in the closet! A bitch of a werewolf movie. Wait, Dad! Dog Soldiers. It'll blow your house down. This is an action horror thriller directed by Neil Marshall. Has a 105 minute runtime, rated R. Stars Sean Pertry, Kevin McKidd, and Emma Cleesby. I watched this on DVD. During a routine nighttime training mission in the Scottish Highlands, a small squad of British soldiers expected to rendezvous with a special ops unit instead find a bloody massacre with a sole survivor. The savage attackers of the special ops team return and the men are rescued by Megan, a zoologist who identifies what hunts them as werewolves. Without transport or communications, the group is forced to retreat to a farmhouse to wait for the full moon to disappear at dawn. Like I said, I decided to end my 2018 horathon with a favorite and figured this was just the right film to end it with. When Dog Soldiers first came out, I wasn't expecting much. I figured maybe an entertaining action horror flick at best. What I ended up getting was a genre film that blurred the lines of multiple genres in an unsuspecting, nearly flawless way. The cast in this film is amazing, the effects are great, the score kicks ass, and it's chock full of action. On top of all of that, there are some great dark comedy moments that stick with you long after the film is done. The way the characters interact and the way they're fleshed out make this film what it is. You also have some of the coolest looking werewolves ever laid out on screen. Through dozens of viewings, this film still manages to kick ass every time I watch it. I've never gotten bored with it, and it still packs just as much of a punch as the first time I viewed it. This is a prime example of blending genres together correctly and effectively. If you've never given this one a chance and you love werewolf flicks as much as I do, then you need to check it out. This still sits at the top of my favorite werewolf films of all times. And honestly, each time I watch it, it climbs the ladder a little bit more. My rating is a 9 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.8 out of 10. Up next. 2015's Dude Bro Party Massacre 3. Brock. This is a safe place. I need you to tell me everything. I don't know if I can talk about that. It's just... so painful. Okay, I'll try. For the brothers of the coolest frat in Chico. Welcome to Delta Bay. You'll see that the party never stops here. Life was a party. A weekend at the lake? Alright! Until the party... Was dead. The fuse box is in the shed. Can you hold my hair back, bro? Oh, a little help, bro? Oh, no! Oh, 
soon the dude bros will taste their own blood. Brace yourself. Nobody is gonna die. Nobody is gonna die. Nobody is gonna die. I trusted you! <gasps> yeah! Yay! Yeah. Hey guys! Oh, oh, no! Come on, no girls allowed! Massacre 3. No, she got you guys too. Oh, you don't care. You don't even know our names. Yep, yeah, yeah, I do. Name us. Todd, no, Turtleneck, Turtleneck Bro, Flannel Bro. Lucky guess. This is a comedy horror directed by Tom Jacobson, Michael Rousselet, and John Salmon. Has a 91 minute runtime. It's rated R. Stars Alec Owen, Ben Gigley, and Olivia Taylor Dudley. I watched this one on Shudder. In the wake of two back-to-back -back mass murders on Chico's frat row, loner Brett Chirino must infiltrate the ranks of a popular fraternity to investigate his twin brother's murder at the hands of the serial killer known as Motherface. I knew nothing about this other than what the synopsis told me. It seemed like it was a parody of low-budget 80s college-themed slasher films. I decided what the hell and threw it on as I wasn't in the mood for anything too serious or dark. This movie is a bit of a twisted par paragram of standard slasher tropes. Everything you love and expected about 80s slasher films turns on its head in reverse. That is both what makes the movie funny and sometimes slightly annoying. This film looks like it was shot on VHS and has that sort of direct-to-video feel of the era. This movie is a mess. There wasn't anything I found particularly well done about it. This is also what makes it work in the context of what it's going for. I'm also thinking it was done intentionally in this way for those various reasons. In the end... I think this movie will appeal to a certain age group of people who grew up on direct-to-video campy horror. It's a niche film in those regards, and what makes it work are the little nods to that air. I'm not really sure how I feel about this one. It did have its moments, but was also a slog to get through at times. Glad I watched it, but also not sure this is one I'm going to revisit anytime soon. My rating is a 5 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.2 out of 10. Up next, 1985's Friday the 13th, A New Beginning. Jason still haunts you. You're not alone. Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning. Severe trauma at age 12. Brutal self-defense murder of a psychopathic killer. Boy, they've given him every therapy they can think of. It's wonder his mind isn't fried with all the drugs they've given him. Directed by Danny Steinman, has a 92-minute runtime, rated R, 
It stars Melanie Kinman, John Shepard, and Anthony Bur- Burrill. I watched this on AMC. Years after Tommy Jarvis murdered hockey mask serial killer Jason Voorhees, he resides in a mental hospital and struggles with the trauma of the experience. When Tommy moves to an isolated halfway house, he has nightmares about Jason's return, and soon one of the patients is killed. As the body count grows, Tommy begins to question his sanity and wonders if Jason has risen from the dead. But, to determine the killer's identity, Tommy will need to survive. Friday the 13th, The New Blood, uh, has always been one of my least favorite films in the series. Except this is the new beginning. Um, It's always seemed a bit scattered and less cohesive than some of the other films. Not that those were all masterpieces of cinema, but this one has always had a weird feel to it. The only other Friday the 13th I've seen less than this one is Jason Goes to Hell, which I've seen maybe two or three times. So because I'm fairly familiar with the series and have watched most of these multiple times, I decided, uh, you know, what the hell, part five and six were on, I might as well watch them. This is still one of my least favorites of the series, but I did enjoy it a hell of a lot more upon this rewatch. One of the reasons I enjoyed it a bit more is I went in knowing that it was going to be and uh, that it was going to be a bit more on the disjointed side. I almost looked at it as an Italian giallo instead of a straight up American slasher. While it still has a lot of issues, I enjoyed it more in the same sense that I enjoyed films like Zombie, House by the Cemetery, or The Church. While it may not make a lot of sense, it's pretty decent visually, and there's some good gore in it. It has a couple of my favorite Friday the 13th kills in it as well, so as that going in for. Um, This is another one that, you know, every time I watch it, it, it's climbing the ladder a little bit more of uh, my favorite Friday the 13th films. Um, So... You know, I, I'm just, uh, I think, I think sooner or later, this one's probably going to end up in my top five, but we'll see. It might take a little while to knock some of those other ones down. Uh, my rating is a 5.5 out of 10. The average IMDB rating is a 4.8 out of 10. Up next. From 1986, Jason Lives, Friday the 13th, part six. <laughs> This is between me and Jason. Jason belongs in hell, and I'm gonna see he gets there. to what that maniac did here. That's why we changed the name. Ah! People want to forget this was Crystal Lake. Just because our parents keep telling us that Jason was only a legend doesn't mean it wasn't true. What if he did come back? Looking for the camp counselor that caused him to drown his wife. We better turn around. Why? Because I've seen enough horror movies to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. This is a horror thriller directed by Tom McLaughlin. It's an 86 minute runtime, rated R, stars Tom Matthews, Jennifer Cook, and David Kagan. I watched this one on AMC. 
Tommy Jarvis goes to the graveyard to get rid of Jason Voorhees' body once and for all, but inadvertently brings him back to life instead. The newly revived killer once again seeks revenge, and Tommy may be the only one who can defeat him. So I woke up early one morning uh, and went down, had breakfast, and Friday the 13th Part 5 and 6 was on AMC's Fear Fest. For, so I was like, what the hell? Even though the Blu-ray was in the next room, I was like, I'm just going to watch these because I want to get off the couch and I have nowhere to be for a couple more hours. So I watched them. Uh, this has always been one of my favorite entries into the Friday the 13th franchise. It's rather interesting because the gore level is toned down you know, a lot compared to other uh, films in the series. In fact, much of the violence is implied or cut away from, which I kind of find interesting. There isn't a whole lot about this one I don't like. The acting is surprisingly solid. I love the soundtrack, and the overall look of the film is top-notch. And some really fun moments. It also has those fun, cheesy moments in as well. There's just something about this one that feels fun. I know that's weird to say about a Friday the 13th film, but it's true. It has some of my favorite moments in the series. In many ways, this one feels a bit self-aware, bringing forth a humor that wasn't in the other films. I know everyone has their favorite in the series, but this one will always be right up there for me as one of mine. Part 4 will pretty much always sit at the top, but this one isn't too far behind. My rating is a 6.5 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6 out of 10. Up next, this is one I've been excited to talk about, and that is 2018's Halloween. Trick or treat! See, my house is here. Which one should we go to? They're all spooky. I'm gonna pick that one over on across the street. Forty years ago, on Halloween night, Michael Myers murdered three people. After that horrific night, he was sent back to the institution in captivity. to Haddonfield, his home. I need to protect my family. You have no security system, Karen. Mom, you need help. Evil is real. There's a reason we're supposed to be afraid of this night. I've been preparing for this for a long time. It is not safe to be on the street tonight. Go home! Get out! He's here. He is a killer, but he will be killed tonight. Happy Halloween, Michael. This is a horror thriller directed by David Gordon Green as a 106 minute runtime rated R stars Jamie Lee Curtis, Judy Greer and Andy Mathichick. I watched this one in the theater. It's been 40 years since Laurie Strode survived a vicious attack from crazed killer Michael Myers on Halloween night. Locked up in an institution, Myers manages to escape when his bus transfer goes horribly wrong. Laurie 
now faces a terrifying showdown when the mass madman returns to Haddonfield, Illinois. But this time, she's ready for him. I have been waiting for this one since I first heard it announced. I was both apprehensive and curious as to what they were going to do with it. Having Jamie Lee Curtis back as Lori really sold it, and while they had done it in the past, this felt a bit different. I'm not an opening weekend kind of guy, but this one, I didn't want to wait on. While this isn't a perfect movie, it was a lot of fun. I never once found myself getting bored. There were some good laughs, decent kills, the music was perfect, and the film itself looked gorgeous. Truthfully, it reminded me more of the first two films than any of the other films in the franchise. Everything to the way shots were lit and framed to the overall coloring, um, you know, it was just awesome. If you're a fan of the series, even though they dismiss the other films in the series, there are nods throughout to the original film, but you really have to pay attention, but they're there. I caught a few of them, uh, I, so I'm kind of interested to watch again to see if I pick out some other ones. I thought the acting was well done. The way the story flows is great. It never gets bogged down on any uh, one thing, which I actually expected it to do. Uh, the way they explore the effects of victim trauma is really interesting as well. I'm sure this will have its haters. Anything new always does, especially when it comes to a beloved franchise like this. Ignore any noise from the crybabies who just want the same film over and over and enjoy this one. Let the sounds of your laughter drown out the, th the, th the thuds of their kicking and screaming as they wind on the floor like a two-year-old. Enjoy it for what it is and have fun. It's a Halloween movie and it's fun. That's all that matters. My rating was a 7 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 7.6 out of 10. Up next, 2014's Honeymoon. So, we didn't get a regular wedding cake. We decided on something that was special for us mm -hmm. instead. I love you, honeybee. So this is the famous family cottage. Do you like it? Here's what I see. The woods. A lake. No one around. B? This isn't funny. B? Please! B! You okay? I couldn't find you. I must be sleepwalking. I'm fine. How's my little zombie face this morning? I made a coffee. I could be human. What's going on with you? You feel distant, different. Did something happen in the woods? They're mosquito bites. They don't look like bug bites. You're acting crazy. You should leave. He's not safe. What's going on? We need to leave. You can't. Where did you put the keys? Where are the keys? He's out there. We shine in the light. I want to protect you. Where is my wife? You look like her, but you're not her. Talk to me! Tell me what's going on! Can we tell me what's going on? Something bad happened to me. Something bad happened to me in the woods. This is a horror mystery thriller directed by Lee Janik. Has an 87 minute runtime, rated R, stars Rose Leslie. Harry Treadway, and Ben Huber. I watched this one on Shudder. A honeymooning bride goes sleepwalking into the woods surrounded a secluding cabin. When she returns, she looks the same, but something about her is frighteningly different. This is one I've heard good things about for a while, but hadn't watched. When I was looking for movies to check out during October that I hadn't seen, this one was recommended and, I also, and also available on Shudder, so I figured I'd throw this one on. 
I quite enjoyed this one. There's nothing too over the top about it. It's a straight ahead, no frills kind of film. When things start to turn in interesting, it does it in a very low key sort of way. And the film becomes very intense. The about face is what makes it so effective. The earlier pacing choices and story combined with some great acting make it really work. The technical aspects are all very solid. Nothing really stood out, but nothing really hindered anything either. This is also a good quick watch. Both leads are fantastic. You feel like they're an actual couple, which I don't think is always the easiest thing to pull off. This is a good film to watch if you want to watch a horror film with someone who maybe doesn't like super intense gore-filled stuff. It's effective, well done, and enjoyable. My rating is a 6 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 5.7 out of 10. Up next, one of the few favorites that I watched this year, you know, one of only a handful, and that is 1959's The House on Haunted Hill. The ghosts are moving tonight, restless, hungry. May I introduce myself? I'm Watson Pritchard. In just a minute, I'll show you the only really haunted house in the world. Since it was built a century ago, seven people, including my brother, have been murdered in it. Since then, I've owned the house. I've only spent one night there, and when they found me in the morning, I, I was almost dead. I'm Frederick Lauren, and I've rented the house on Haunted Hill tonight so that my wife can give a party, a haunted house party. <laughs> She's so amusing. There'll be food and drink and ghosts, and perhaps even a few murders. You're all invited. If any of you will spend the next 12 hours in this house, I'll give you each $10,000 or your next of kin in case you don't survive. Ah, but here come our other guests. It was my wife's idea to have our guests come in funeral cars. <laughs> She's so amusing. Her sense of humor is, shall we say, original. I dreamed up the hearse. It's empty now, but after a night in the house on Haunted Hill, who knows? This is Lance Schroeder, a test pilot, so no doubt a brave man. But don't you think you can be much braver if you're paid for it? And I happen to know that Lance needs the 10000 I'll give him, if he's brave enough to stay all night. This is a horror mystery, directed by William Castle in Rosemary Horvath, has a 75-minute runtime, not rated, stars Vincent Price, Carol Omart and Richard Long. I watched this on DVD. Rich oddball Frederick Lauren has a proposal for five guests at a possibly haunted mansion. Show up, survive a night filled with scares, and receive $10,000 each. The guest of honor is Lauren's estranged wife, Annabelle, who, with her secret lover, Dr. Trent, has con con her the app. Coerced through their own scheme to scare Lauren's associate, Nora Manning, into shooting the potentially crazy millionaire. But more spooks and shocks throw a wrench into the plan. This is one I've seen a handful of times over the year, and I've always enjoyed it. Being a big Vincent Price fan, this is one of those films I feel is synonymous with his horror legend. I know I think of this, The Last Man on Earth, and House of Wax when I think of his classic performances, not to mention the countless other films he was in. If you think about the time period this film came out, it was well ahead of the curve. Many of today's modern horror films take a bit of a cue from this. The mystery mixed with the horror aspects, add in powerful performances by the cast, a simple but eerie score, and you have an effective film. The atmosphere of the whole film is great from start to finish. While it does have some flaws and plot holes, not to mention our main protagonist is a bit of an asshole, Price's performance still sucks you in and you can't help but be captivated by it. 
In my opinion, this is a must-see for any fan of horror, if for nothing else to see the influence it had on modern horror. That alone makes it something to appreciate. My rating is an 8 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.9 out of 10. Up next, from 1953, Invaders from Mars. <laughs> Invaders from Mars. He saw them land from outer space. He saw them capture innocent people only to destroy. <laughs> Father turned against son. People changed into strange, weird animals. A general of the army becomes a saboteur. Trusted police turned into arsonists. The boy's parents changed into killers. But nobody's getting anywhere out there. Nobody can locate anything. Anybody. The Martians. We've got to start the... Invaders from Mars, capturing humans at will for their own sinister purposes, turning them into diabolical instruments of destruction. <laughs> Invaders from Mars, weird, fantastic beings of a super intelligence, ruling a race of synthetic humans and pitting them against mankind's dream to conquer the universe. Come on, step on it. Search every tunnel. We gotta find Ronaldo and the kid. When the colonel gives the signal, get back here on the double. This is a horror sci-fi directed by William Cameron Menzies has a 78 minute runtime, not rated stars Helena Carter, Arthur Franz and Jimmy Hunt. I watched this on Amazon prime curious, curious adolescent boy, David McLean confronts aliens who have set up base in his backyard. The extraterrestrials intend to use mind control on the local townsfolk. Determined to stop the invaders who have already co-opted his father, he attempts to warn others. But when local law officers also succumb, David teams up with astronomer Stuart Kelson and Dr. Pat Blake, and the trio must fight together to repeal the insidious intruders. One I've always remembered hearing about but never got a chance to watch. I queued it up a while ago on Prime and figured it was a good time to watch it. It was it was short, something easy to kind of throw on. And uh this one is a fair, fairly solid in a lot of aspects. In many ways, it's super cheesy and schlocky, and I'm okay with that. The story is interesting, the acting solid, and for the time period, I thought the effects looked good for the most part. I can see why this is lauded, uh, you know, so so lauded in a such a well-known film when it comes to genre films. While it's very much a product of the time period it was made, it's still an easy watch. Something you can throw on in the background, not get too wrapped up in, and just let play out. My rating is a 5.5 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.5 out of 10. Up next, from 1959, Plan 9 from Outer Space. It is safe to state that the grandchildren of some of the people in this theater will not be born on Earth. They come from the bowels of hell, 
a transformed race of walking dead. Zombies guided by a master plan for complete domination of the Earth. Plan 9 from outer space. Starring the most frightmarish cast ever, Bella Lugosi, the seductive vampira, and Thor Johnson as the walking dead. Turn off your electro gun! No! No! Stop him, Dennis! I can't get it! It's jammed! Stop him, you fool! Bullets bounce off their bodies. Rockets, missiles, jets cannot stop their death ships. What earthly power can stop this terror? For a glimpse of things to come, see this blast of screen suspense. For it could be happening right now. This is a horror sci-fi directed by Edward D. Wood Jr. Has a 79-minute runtime, not rated. Stars Gregory Walcott, Tom Keene, and Mona McKinnon. I watched this one on Amazon Prime. Evil aliens attack Earth and set their terrible Plan 9 in action. As the aliens resurrect the dead of the Earth to destroy the living, our lives are in danger. I have only seen this once, and it was the colorized version. I've never actually watched it in black and white. Uh, I noticed it was on Prime, so I figured, why the hell not? I've seen enough of the movie, Edward, <laughs> that I feel I should uh, be better versed with this one. The movie is so gloriously bad, but bad in an entertaining way. I'll give Ed Wood points for the tenacity it took to get this thing made, but you can't deny this is just awful. Though it is awful, it's the over-the-top nature of everything, from the terrible dialogue and acting to the corny special effects that make it what it is. Watching it, I can't help but think the film alone could have inspired Mystery Science Theater 3000. Uh, I couldn't recommend this to anyone as a good film, but if you're a genre fan, it's almost a must watch. It sure as hell will make you appreciative of good genre films. Uh, my rating for this is a 3 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 4 out of 10. Up next, from 1983, Sleepaway Camp. Dear Mom and Dad... I've been at a sleepaway camp for almost three weeks, and I'm getting very scared. Welcome to sleepaway camp. Someone is watching you. Hey, Baba, Reba! Someone is waiting for you. Someone wants to scare you to death. Turn it! Turn the wheel! Oh my God! Sleep away, camp. You won't be coming home. This is a horror directed by Robert Hiltzik. Has an 84 minute runtime, rated R, stars Felissa Rose, Jonathan Tiersten, and Karen Fields. I watched this one on Amazon Prime. Bunks in the showers are a mad stabber's beat at a summer camp strictly for teens. This is one of those legendary horror films that I've heard about for years but never watched. It's always seemed to be a bit on the polarizing side of things. People either seem to love it or hate it. I haven't really heard too many people who are middle of the road. I decided I finally needed to see it. This was the year, especially with my overall goal of this horathon to watch stuff I hadn't seen. I'm kind of at a loss for words with this one. I just don't get it. Not only did I find this movie superbly creepy for all the wrong reasons, I found myself extremely bored. The technical aspects of the film weren't too bad. The gore was almost non-existent. Which, that was kind of a huge disappointment for me, because I really expected a splatter fest for some reason. While I don't need to have gore for horror to be effective, I kind of expect it with an 80s slasher. 
But there were moments here and there where you kind of go, I get it. This is one of those films that I wonder if I had grown up watching, if I would appreciate more. Seeing it for the first time now, it just does nothing for me. I will give this another watch at some point because I don't know if my expectations of the film got in the way of my enjoyment. Um, I know it has its fans, but while I can't say I flat out hated it after my first viewing, I can't say that I'm one of them. I will give it points for trying something different, if for nothing else. And as I talked about with Eric Marner on... Uh, the last episode of the show, I had the ending of this film spoiled for me, and uh, that kind of screwed things up a little bit. And I think if I hadn't had the ending spoiled, it would have had a little bit more of an impact on me film-wise. Uh, my rating is a 4.10, uh, uh, 4, 4 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.3 out of 10. Up next from 1992, Split Second. I unloaded a full clip, 450 Magnum, point blank. It disappeared. He can hear its heartbeat. Where did he go? He knows it's out there. Somebody must have seen something. He knows what it can do. You're telling me there's something running around loose in this city. Ripping the hearts out of people and eating them. Maybe he eats them for breakfast. Now, it's really pissing him off. Buster! And his new partner... I work alone. ...makes two. Paranoid people with guns are a menace to society. You'd be paranoid, too, if you had a dipshit like this following you. Stuck up nonos and serial homicide. Oh, terrific. It has no motive. The only thing we know for sure is that he's not a vegetarian. No! It has the DNA structure of all its victims. It gives no warning. We're ready to die. But one thing's for certain. We could to get bigger guns! It ain't no pushover. Two, yeah. Bingo! We want to get to Cannon Street. <laughs> Made up. Yes, we do. Boy, are you pushy. I wouldn't say this thing thinks it's Satan. I'd say it is Satan. Rat bastard! Satan is a deep shit. Get out of there! Ah. Five seconds! Okay, four, three, oh. two, oh. Oh. Rutger Hauer. Split second. Nice timing. Split second. This is an action crime horror directed by Tony Malum. Has a 90 minute runtime, rated R. Stars Rutger Hauer, Kim Cattrall, and Alistair Duncan. I watched this one on Amazon Prime. In a flooded dystopian future London, Detective Harley Stone hunts a serial killer who murdered his partner and has hunted him ever since. He soon discovers what he is hunting might not be human. I remember seeing the cover for this one at the video store when I was a kid. Honestly, I never thought it looked that good. The cover was kind of bad, but it had Rutger Hauer in it, so I almost picked it up and uh, to check it out a few times, but never quite did. Um, alas, it kind of faded from memory. Um, not too long ago, a friend of mine watched and, re and reviewed it on his show, so when it came across Amazon Prime, I decided what the hell and gave it a watch. This is one of those weird movies from the early 90s that both very much feels like it should have had a theater run and also gone direct to video. Think movies like Cyborg and No Escape, the production value is decent, but it doesn't feel quite as epic as it should. Like they had this grand plan, but didn't quite have the money to make their vision happen. So they worked with what they had and managed to pull off a really pretty good looking film. Well, while this isn't what I would call a great film, it manages to be highly entertaining. 
It's a bit unbalanced, but the film's weird quirks actually work in its favor. You get to know the characters, their idiosyncrasies, and go on an adventure as they hunt down a mysterious serial killer. In a lot of ways, this feels like something that might have been adapted from a comic book. Even the character names feel like they were taken out of a comic. It's pretty middle-of-the-road film in all aspects. Not too action-heavy, not too gory, not too funny, but it has a little of all those things. The acting's okay, I'll bet over-the-top at times. In the end, it all comes together and manages, it manages to be rather entertaining. I think I would pick this one up if I ever came across it for cheap. If, if you like a film that's uh, about as mixed genre as you get... <laughs> This is uh, one to check out. It's an easy viewing, one you can just sit back, enjoy, and not have to think a whole hell of a lot about while watching. My rating is a 5.5 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.2 out of 10. Up next, from 1987, Stage Fright. This is a horror thriller directed by Michael Sovey as a 90 minute runtime rated R stars David Brandon, Barbara Capisti and Domenico Fiore. I watched this one on shutter. A group of stage actors lock themselves in a theater for a rehearsal of their upcoming musical production. Unaware an escaped psychopath has snuck into the theater with them. While I'm a big fan of Michelle Sovey's work like Cemetery Man and the Church, Stage Fright was never one I cared for. Granted, I only saw, I think, once or twice, but it just didn't quite hit the same way his other films did. I partially wonder if it's because I saw it after those and was expecting something quite different. When I noticed this was available on Shudder, I decided I would give it another shot. <coughs> Excuse me. I have to say I like this a lot more this time around. Knowing a bit more about the film and that it wasn't like his other films, it didn't throw me off as much. For a Sylvie film, this one is quite different. Instead of a heavy, supernatural, and Argento-esque film, we get a pretty straight-ahead slasher. The first half of the film felt like a bit of a slog to get through for me, but once it gets going, it gets going in a big way. It saves the film, in my honest opinion. There are some inventive kills, and it has a bit of that Sovi magic you felt in his other films. 
Overall, the technical aspects are well done. Like I said, while this still isn't my favorite Sophie film, I'm glad I gave it another chance. It's a solid genre entry, and I think one I need to add back to my collection eventually. My rating is a 6.5 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.8 out of 10. All right, we're getting getting there. We still got some more films to go. Uh, hope you're hanging in with me still. And up next is 2015's The Devil's Candy. We come to the place where we joke about the idea of the devil. But that is Satan's lie to distract us from the reality of who he is. Hear what's going on? It's like it flowed through me. I don't remember painting this. This is mommy and daddy's house. They're dead. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I need to come home now. We are his pawns. We are his demons on earth. He uses us to carry out his unspeakable deeds. satiate his hunger. The whole latest work is wonderfully disturbing. Oh my God. I didn't mean to do this. To sacrifice. He will slither into your soul. He has no mask in a Halloween store. He's not what you see in the movies. He is an active, violent, personal reality. Just the gas? This is a drama horror thriller directed by Sean Byrne as a 79 minute runtime. It's not rated, stars Ethan Embry, Sherry Appleby, Pruitt Taylor Vince. I watched this one on Netflix. A struggling painter is possessed by satanic forces after he and his family move into their dream home. This has been on my Netflix queue forever. I didn't have a ton of time to watch a movie, and this was just about the right length for me to be able to squeeze it in. So, I finally got around to watching it. This is a no-frills, straight-ahead, you know, uh, straight-to-the-meat-and-potatoes kind of film. That's one of the benefits of having a short runtime. Once it's set up, it moves right along in a very creepy and effective manner. The acting's great, the film looks excellent, and I was honestly a little disturbed. That doesn't happen very often with me, so it gets points for that alone. Sound effects play a big role in making this film work, which is something I often feel is underutilized in horror. It can also be overdone, but this manages to find just the right balance. While the whole cast was great in this, Pruitt Taylor Vince makes this film what it is with his disturbing portrayal. It's so simplified that it actually adds an extra layer of creepiness. If you haven't seen this one yet and like well done, creepy, effective horror, you should give it a view. My rating is an 8 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 6.4 out of 10. Up next, one that Eric and I talked about on the last show, and that is 1973's The Exorcist. Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world. The world of darkness. Nobody expected it. 
Let's see what Nobody believed it. And nothing could stop it. There are no experts. You probably know as much about possession as most priests. Look, your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She says she's the devil himself. I'm telling you that that thing upstairs isn't my daughter. Now, I want you to tell me that you know for a fact that there's nothing wrong with my daughter except in her mind. You tell me you know for a fact that an exorcism wouldn't do any good. You tell me that. The one hope. The only hope. The exorcist. This one's a horror, directed by William Friedkin, has a 122-minute runtime, rated R, stars Ellen Burtson, Max Van Sydow, and Linda Blair. I watched this one on VHS. One of the most profitable horror movies ever made, this tale of an exorcism is based loosely on actual events. When young Regan starts acting odd, levitating, speaking in tongues, her worried mother (laughs) seeks medical help, only to hit a dead end. A local priest, whoever, thinks the girl may be seized by the devil. The priest makes a request to perform an exorcism, and the church sends in an expert to help with the difficult job. I have seen bits and pieces of this one over the years, but have never actually sat down and watched the whole film. It has been on my list of classic genre films that I felt I should see for a long time, so I finally was in the right mood and threw it on. One of the things about this movie I've always found interesting is the impact it has on people. Going into it, I figured I was about to watch the most horrifying film of all time based on the things I've heard about it over the years. After all, it is one of those films that is synonymous with the genre and quite legendary. This is a really good movie. It's really long-winded, and honestly, I didn't find this the least bit scary or disturbing. This is also not a film I will probably ever watch again. Uh, You know, never say never. But uh, it's just not my cup of tea as far as films go. While I can appreciate it for what it is and what it meant to the genre, it's not the type of film I crave or even seek out. From a technical standpoint, the film is great. It looks good. The effects work. It's solid. The story is good and the score is awesome. There are also some great performances by the actors involved with the film. All of that makes it an enjoyable movie. I can see why this film has garnered so many accolades over the years just based on those points alone. I think for people of deep belief, I can see why this would be terrifying and disturbing. For those who are not, I'm not sure it would have quite the same resonating effects. Maybe that's just a misjudgment on my part, but regardless, it's a well-made film and a good story, which I can appreciate, even if it doesn't resonate with me the same way it does with other people. Uh, My rating is an 8 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is an 8 out of 10. We're almost there. I got three films left. Up next, 1985's The Stuff. No! Don't eat that! I saw it moving the refrigerator. Here, Jason. Take some. There is something alive in there. They're good for us, Jason. (laughs) They kill the bad things inside us. Must be a side effect of eating too much dessert. We are not alone. Tonight, America is in grave danger. So are you prepared to say on the air that you've actually seen people devoured by the stuff? Oh, hell yes. And what's worse, I've seen what's left of them when the stuff gets through and comes back up. Pictures. 
This is a comedy horror sci-fi directed by Larry Cohen. Has an 87-minute runtime. Rated R. Stars Michael Moriarty, Andrea Markovich, and Garrett Morris. I watched this on Shudder. A delicious, mysterious goo that oozes from the earth is marketed as the newest dessert sensation. But the tasty treat rots more than the teeth when zombie-like snackers who only want to consume more of the strange substance at any cost begin infecting the world. I've seen this one before, at least most of it. It was one I really wanted to sit down and watch from to start to finish this year. This is a fun schlock classic. It's such a weird but genius concept. The film itself moves along at a good pace, and despite some of the oddities about it, it manages to be a very enjoyable flick. Sure, there are lots of common sense problems with it, but I, but based on what the film is, I can more or less accept those faults for what they are. The stuff is one of those films where I think the message is pretty obvious. It's all about blind consumerism and the effect it has on people. At least that's what I got out of it. Maybe that wasn't the intent, but it sure felt that way. It's not so in your face that it ruins the movie. It's just a layer to this bizarre film and what makes it interesting. It's a movie I can appreciate for what it is, and it's a lot of fun. Cheesy, bizarre goodness that I can't wait to watch again. I definitely need to pick this one up on Blu-ray. My rating is a 7 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 5.9 out of 10. Up next, uh, one of my one of my all time favorites from 1954, them. I tell you, gentlemen, science has agreed that unless something is done and done quickly, man, as the dominant species of life on Earth, will be extinct within a year. <laughs> of the President of the United States. Stay in your homes, I repeat. Stay in your homes. Your personal safety, the safety of the entire city, depends upon your full cooperation with the military authorities. Yes, cities, nations, even civilization itself, threatened with annihilation because in one moment of history-making violence, nature, mad, rampant, wrought its most awesome creation. For born in that swirling inferno of radioactive dust were things so horrible, so terrifying, so hideous. There is no word to describe them. We may be witnesses to a biblical prophecy come true, and thus will be destruction and darkness come up in creation, and the beast shall reign over the earth. Yes, the earth, the skies above and the seas below, infested by swarms of nightmare creatures, crueler, deadlier than the armored giants of prehistoric eras. Here is a wild, headlong flight into terror as the desert erupts with the grim battle for survival. Here is a fear-frenzied moment of suspense as mankind totters before a thing that multiplies faster than it can be killed. Here is a desperate plunge into the black depths of the earth where human courage challenges the brute force, the slashing jaws, the poison fangs that guard the subterranean nest where the beast spawns its terrible progeny. To all units, to all units, condition red, grain 267 is the target area. Repeat, condition red, grain 267 is the target area. We can't take a chance. It might poison the whole city. This 
is a horror sci-fi directed by Gordon Douglas. It's a 94-minute runtime, not rated. Stars James Whitmore, Edmund Gwen, and Joan Weldon. I watched this one on Blu-ray. While investigating a series of mysterious deaths, Sergeant Ben Peterson finds a young girl who is unable to speak. As Peterson joins forces with FBI agent Robert Graham and scientist Dr. Harold Medford, he discovers that all the incidents are due to giant ants that have been mutated by atomic radiation. Peterson and Graham, with the aid of the military, attempt to find the queen ants and destroy the nest before the danger spreads. This one has been a favorite of mine since I first saw it several years ago. Since I was able to get a good Blu-ray copy, it, be, it has become a fairly regular viewing. One I throw out at least every year or two, sometimes more than once in a year. Well, I have been uh, knocking out a lot of stuff I haven't seen for Horror Thou in 2018. I was ready to revisit a favorite. There's just something about this one I've always enjoyed. For the time period that it came out, the effects are excellent. Quite ahead of its time in many ways, in my honest opinion. Uh, this fits right in with other giant monster movies from that area. Frankly, I feel like it stands atop the ant hill, so to speak. Uh, compared to most of them, the technical aspects are all great. The transfer is great, the sound's excellent, it has some great sound effects, the acting's good, and the story itself is very well done. While many of the sci-fi horror films of this era weren't taken seriously, or so it seemed, this one is played fairly straight, which is one of the reasons I think it stands out so much. There really isn't much to complain about with this one. If you're a fan of classic monster movies and haven't seen this one yet, it's a must-see. My rating is a 9 out of 10. The average IMDb rating is a 7.3 out of 10. And last, this is kind of a cool one to, to end the 2018 Horathon review casts with, and that is 2017's To Hell and Back, The Kane Hodder Story. I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. Kane played Jason, and Jason is a huge character. The hockey mask, the way he moves, his bulk, all of that is the logo. Most people wouldn't think of Kane as being like, you know, kind of a nice, basically mellow, soft-spoken guy. You know, I'm sure he has his moments, but uh, I think that would be very surprising to a lot of people. And go through what he's gone through, I can't even imagine. I talked to this reporter and she said, let's do a story about the local kid that's making his way in the stunt business. You know, I'll give you some pictures and if you want, I'll do a fire stunt for you live. He put his arm out away from himself to be safe and when he lit the match, he ignited. Completely burst into flames everywhere. And it's a, it's a horrifying story because it's bad enough, you know, being burned, obviously, but all the other things that went wrong, I mean, just, it couldn't have been worse. If I read it in a book, I would read it and say, that can't all be true. He's exaggerating. And unfortunately, it was. That basically started uh, the next six months of horrific torture. Can we cut for a second? This is a documentary directed by Derek Dennis Habert. Has a 108 minute runtime. It's not rated. Stars Kane Hodder, Mike Alosi, and John Carl Beekler. I watched this one on Amazon Prime. The emotional story of Kane Hodder, who survived a harrowing childhood and near death accident, to become one of film's biggest and most beloved horror icons. I've been interested to see this since I first heard about it. Kane is one of those horror icons that seems like an interesting guy. He's one of the best stuntmen in the business and has been some of the biggest characters in horror, like Jason Voorhees and Victor Crowley. 
I figured if anything, it wouldn't be a dull watch. I'm a sucker for documentaries anyway. Combine that with my love of horror, and this was pretty much a no-brainer for me. Uh, this was actually much more than I expected. It, it has a lot of heart. We learn about Kane and how he came into acting stunt work, the trials and tribulations he's gone through, as well as the triumphs. There are loads of interviews with members of the horror community, friends, and Kane himself. I don't want to spoil anything, so I will leave it at that. Even if you're not a big horror fan, it's worth a watch. A must-see for those of us who are horror junkies. It's a damn interesting view. We get a glimpse into the life of one of the people most synonymous with the genre. It's touching, funny, and as I said, has a lot of heart. My rating is an 8 out of 10. The average IMDB rating is a 7.8 out of 10. And that wraps it up for the review cast portion of this. But we're going to keep going just a little bit here. I'm going to break down all the movies I watched real quick. Just to give you a recap of the list. And uh, I got a few things to talk about after that real quick. And then we'll end the show. So thank you for everybody that's hung out for the horror this year and followed along. And I hope you guys got to see some awesome movies. And maybe even got a few recommendations from stuff that I talked about on here. So breaking down the horathon for 2018, I watched 26 films off my list of that I had originally started with out of those 57. Um, there were 26 first time viewings and 25 repeat watches. But I will say with the repeat watches, the majority of those were films that I had only seen once, twice tops. Um, you know, there were a few favorites in there just because I couldn't go the whole horathon without throwing some, some favorites on, you know, but overall, I, I was pretty happy with, with what I achieved in total. I watched 51 movies this year, um, which I believe is quite a bit more than my last year's horathon total. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Cause I'm kind of curious now. Uh, if I, if I can, I'm not sure. Let me, uh, let me find that 31 days. Oh, there, there it is. Uh, so in, uh, do, 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 do. that's not it. I know this is, I'm sure this is rather just exhilarating, uh, for you guys. <laughs> I'm trying to find out what the hell I actually had on my list. So Last year, I had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So, yeah, I only managed to hit 31 last year. So, I eviscerated that by 20 movies, which is awesome. Um, Like I said, you know, sometimes, not that it's a slog to get through, but as I've mentioned in previous episodes, episodes you know sometimes man i just get a little burned out watching straight horror all the time granted i love horror probably more than any genre uh, out there but i can i i have to watch other stuff too because it's just this is the type of person i am i tend to go on little binges of you know sci-fi or action or comedy or whatever um so like a whole month of nothing but horror and I literally do not watch anything else but horror during October. So sometimes, a lot of times, especially when I'm just re-watching stuff I've seen, it becomes a slog. So it was really cool this year to throw on stuff I hadn't seen. And it kind of re, you know, it got me reinvigorated and, uh, you know, made me really enjoy uh, this year made a lot of fun and truthfully I really wasn't even ready for it to end this year but I think I'm gonna stop as I said you know when I was talking to Eric on the last episode um and uh you know kind of get that whole not burn myself out or you know um watch too many so I I don't want to you know because normally what happens is I burn myself out and then I don't watch any horror for like three months. I think this year it's going to be a lot easier for me to just kind of ease back into it because there's still a bunch of stuff that I had on my list that I want to watch, but, um, I never got to. So now that I'm not maybe so quite so pressed, I can kind of watch them at my own leisure. I'll be getting a bunch of those in as well. 
So I'm going to go through and just kind of redo the, do a breakdown of the list in the order that I watch the films. Film number one was Creep Show 2. Uh, I gave that a 6.5 out of 10. Film number two was Boogeyman. Uh, that was a 3.5 out of 10. Movie three was In the Mouth of Madness. I gave that an 8.5 out of 10. Movie four, Demons, 7 out of 10. Movie five, Ghost Ship, 5 out of 10. Movie six, Scarecrow, 3 out of 10. Movie seven, The Ritual, 7 out of 10. Uh, movie 8, Event Horizon, 7.5 out of 10. Movie 9, The Witch, 10 out of 10. Movie number 10, Summer of 84, I give that an 8 out of 10. Movie 11, Pumpkinhead 2, Blood Wings, 2 out of 10, which I think was my lowest rated movie of the whole horathon. That movie was just awful. Uh, movie 12, Tales from the Crypt, Bordello of Blood, 6 out of 10. Movie 13, Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, 7 out of 10. Movie 14, Late Phases, 8 out of 10. Movie 15, Phenomena, 8 out of 10. Movie 16, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, the original, 5 out of 10. Movie 17, The Thing From Another World, 7 out of 10. Movie 18, Creepy Crawlers, a.k.a. The Nest, 5 out of 10. Movie 19, Deep Rising, 6.5 out of 10. Movie 20, Mom and Dad, 6 out of 10. Movie 21, As Above, So Below, 6 out of 10. 22, Darkness Falls, 3 out of 10. 23, Splinter, 6 out of 10. 24, Turbo Kid, 9 out of 10. 25, Frogs, 3 out of 10. Movie 26, Evil Dead, the remake, 7 out of 10. Movie 27, Cat's Eye, 4 out of 10. 28, Screams of the Wolf, 3.5 out of 10. 29, Cemetery Man, 9 out of 10. Movie 30, Cabin in the Woods, 9 out of 10. 31, Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory, 6 out of 10. 32, Dubro Party Massacre, 3, 5 out of 10. 33, The Exorcist, 8 out of 10. Honeymoon, 6 out of 10. 35, Halloween, 7 out of 10. The 2018 one. 36, Altered, 5.5 out of 10. 37, Cooties, 6.5 out of 10. 38, Split Second, 5.5 out of 10. 39, The Devil's Candy, 8 out of 10. 40, To Hell and Back, The Kane Hodder Story, 8 out of 10. 41, Sleepaway Camp, 4 out of 10. 42, Them, 9 out of 10. 43, Friday the 13th, Part 5, 5.5 5 out of 10. 44, Friday the 13th, Part 6, 6.5 out of 10. 45, House on Haunted Hill, 8 out of 10. 46, The Stuff, 7 out of 10. 47, Digging Up the Marrow, 5 out of 10. 48, Plan 9 from Outer Space, 3 out of 10. 49, Invaders from Mars, 5.5 5 out of 10. 50, Stage Fright, 6.5 out of 10. And 51, the last movie of my horathon of 2018, Dog Soldiers, 9 out of 10. Again, thank you guys so much for tuning in and checking out the podcast and following along with me during Horathon 2018. It has been a lot of fun. For those of you listening um, who want a little bit more Horathon 2018, I will be on um, the Movie Freaks podcast with Eric Marner and Eugene Weaver, who are frequent guests of my show as well. And we will be uh, rap talking Horathon 2018 and breaking some stuff down and just chatting. That's going to be a lot of fun. I always have a blast with Eugene and Eric. Um, so it should be a hell of a good episode. Uh, that will be coming up. Not this. Uh, so when you're hearing this, their episode will be dropping. I think on the 13th will be the, the episode air date. So if you haven't subscribed to the movie freaks podcast yet, I suggest you go do it because it is one of my personal favorite podcasts. Um, not just because I'm friends with the guys, just because it is entertaining as all hell. And I look forward to it every week. So go find the movie freaks podcast, wherever f you're listening to average Joe's driving, you'll find the movie freaks. Um, 
I know I'm going on and on here, and I'm sorry. There's a lot to talk about in this episode as we're wrapping up Horathon 2018. Um, so this is going to be my last episode for a couple weeks. I will be returning uh, the last week of November with a couple of special guests uh, coming up, which is going to be a lot of fun, and some review, you know, the usual format, review cast, and... Coming up in December, um, there will be a Chris, another Christmas crossover special with the Movie Freaks podcast, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're talking about what we're doing with that one. I think you guys will have a good time. It will be something different. Um, right now, it's looking like something I have never done um, for a podcast, and it's something you guys will be able to kind of follow with at home if we do it, uh, what we're talking about right now anyway. So we'll kind of let you know ahead of time once we get this all figured out exactly. Anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. Anyway, thank you guys all so much for listening to the podcast. Um, please, as I always say at the end of the show, I know everybody probably doesn't wait to the very end, but, um, you know, hit up the Facebook page, the Instagram, Twitter, uh, Twitter, TWJ author, Instagram, Thomas Washburn Jr. Um, you can find me on Facebook at Average Joe's Drive-In. Uh, or go to thomaswashburnjr.com and there's links to everything. You can even find links to like my music and my books. And if you want to support the show, please snag books. If you've got Kindle Unlimited, you can read the books for free. And I get paid for the pages read and all that money helps support this show. So thank you guys very much. And remember, opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. And I will see you sexy animals on the flip side. It's intermission. Rise and stretch time. Time to refresh yourself and visit our snack bar. Got a yen for hot popcorn? Your favorite soft drinks are sparkling cold. The juicy Frank sizzling hot. There's delicious coffee freshly brewed. And all kinds of ice cream and candy to tempt you. Showtime will be announced loud and clear to get you back to your car in time. So stretch your legs. Come to the snack bar now. Thanks for listening to Average Joe's Drive-In. If you'd like to talk movies or contact the show, add our social media pages. You can add us on Facebook at Average Joe's Drive-In Podcast, on Twitter at TWJ Author, on Instagram at Thomas Washburn Jr. You can also hit up www.thomaswashburnjr.com for more information about the show and related links. If you'd like to support the show, you can buy TJ's books on Amazon. Just type in Thomas Washburn Jr. in the search. Books are available in Kindle and paperback formats. If you have Kindle Unlimited or Prime, you can read the books for free and money will be earned by the pages read. It doesn't cost you anything and it supports the show. Until next time... You've been listening to Average Joe's Drive-In.